Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, your morning and or afternoon if you're joining us on the East Coast. Um, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Community Relations for the Solve ME CFS Initiative, uh, Solve ME, and I am so pleased to bring you this webinar today, Fighting the Good Fight, Navigating the ERISA Disability Process for Those with ME CFS. Um, we'll do just a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so just a couple items on uh, your ability to speak and interact with our wonderful presenter today. Um, so for those of us who have not joined our webinar before, uh, our audience is muted. We're unable to take audio questions, but you can type your question to us uh, in the question box. And you'll see um, on the lovely picture right there, the highlighted question box that you see on your user panel. Um, that's where you'll type a question. We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. And um, our wonderful presenter, Andrew Cantor, has actually agreed to stay a little extra if there are additional questions. So we'll do our best to keep it um, to your manageable energy levels, but we can go longer because um, he's been so generous with his time. Um, for those folks who may need to leave early or you feel like you missed a part, don't worry, um, our webinars are recording, um, all completely recorded, and all the recordings are made available on our YouTube channel, which is solvecfs at youtube.com, and also on our website as well. Um, and of course, just to be clear, um, the Solve MECFS initiative cannot provide medical or legal advice, um, but Mr. Cantor <laughs> is so kind to join us and he can. Um, so once again, we'll have a small pause while we begin the recording process. And um, thank you once again for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Community Relations here at the Solve ME CFS Initiative. And we are so pleased to bring you, uh, as part of our 2019 advocacy webinar series, Fighting the Good Fight, Navigating the ERISA Disability Process for Those with ME-CFS with our wonderful guest presenter, Andrew Cantor Esquire, who comes to us from Cantor & Cantor uh, Law Firm. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Cantor is an associate attorney who began his work as a client advocate long before he became an attorney. Um, after he graduated college, Mr. Cantor worked at Cantor & Cantor as an intake director, and when in law school, he worked as a legal extern for, as a, for a consumer walk watchdog group, a public consumer organization specializing in consumer side insurance issues in the class action context. He also used his ERISA and disability experience to write a seminar paper regarding the incorporation of RICO into wrongfully denied insurance claim. Andrew's practice is focused primarily on helping individuals obtain wrongfully denied disability and life insurance benefits in both ERISA and non-ERISA bad faith policies. Um, and so he has extensive experience working with clients who have ME-CFS and we're so pleased that he's taking that experience and knowledge and expertise and joining us to, uh, to help our community better understand how to get their rights and, and payments in this process. So without further ado, Mr. Cantor, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. I, I really appreciate that that introduction um, and for you giving me the opportunity to, to be here and to speak. Um, and thank you to everyone who who's taking the the time out of your out of your day to come hear me present. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with with dozens of you know if not hundreds of point clients, um, dozens with MECFS and. You know, one thing most of you have in common is that you're all pretty incredible. You know, all the what you have to put up with that, you know, normal people seeking, you know, people with normal situations seeking medical care, um, the efforts you have to undertake and the fights you have to undertake on a regular basis. Um, it, it's pretty amazing that, that you all do it and you all do. Um, so I'm, I'm really thankful that I get to be here to, to speak to all of you. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I've kind of fallen into um, not only the disability uh, practice, or just suing disability, uh, suing insurance companies who don't pay disability claims, but um, having something of a niche in in disability claims focused on MECFS and, and the related issues. Um, I started practicing about five years ago, and in one of my first cases, or just several cases, were MECFS appeals, um, and I very quickly realized how much more needed to be done, not just by us, the lawyers, but by 
those in the community trying to support you and trying to help you. So, you know, a lot of my practice is not only fighting for the people who I'm, I'm representing, but is, is working to build um, awareness and improve the quality of the evidence that your doctors can get you and that you can go out and obtain on your own. Um, before we, we start, Emily's going to provide a, a quick poll so I can kind of get a sense of where everyone is in the process, uh, whether you don't even have disability coverage yet or you, your claim's already been denied. Um, and that'll help me focus in on certain areas um, and we can go from there. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so we'll begin the polling process right now. Everyone, you should see on your screen um, the polling question. Please select the option which best describes your current situation. Um, the options are, I do not currently have disability insurance coverage. I have disability insurance, but I will not file for disability. Uh, I have disability insurance and will file for disability. I have disability insurance and I have filed and are currently receiving disability, or I have disability insurance and have filed and currently being denied. Um, so the polling questions are coming in. I see we have about 38% of folks have voted. So we'll just wait a few more moments um, for everyone to click the answer that best applies to them. Um, and if I right. could clarify, oh, you know, the, the second the option that says will not file, it, it, what that really should say is that you don't have any immediate intent. Obviously, you never know if you're going to file down the road. That's why you have disability insurance. Um, and the option that says will file for disability means you have a specific intent to file within the next couple of months, um, is that you, you realize you're not able to cut it at work and you intend to file. Um, the last two options are pretty self-explanatory. If you, if you filed for disability and you're getting benefits, um, the other option is if you filed and, and your benefits have been denied. Um, if they've been denied in part, whether you've been limited or they've underpaid you or there's any, any kind of issue, um, select the denied option because that'll that, that'll be helpful to me. Wonderful. I, thank you so much. I see that um, about 90% of folks have responded to the poll, so I'm going to go ahead and close polling in three, two, one. Great. So here we have our results. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. It looks about 39% about of folks who answered do not currently have disability insurance coverage. Um, about 18% of folks have disability insurance but are not immediately planning on filing. Um, about 14% have disability insurance and are planning on filing. 14% uh, also have disability insurance, have currently filed and are currently receiving support. And um, about 16% of folks, and um, those are the folks that I think are gonna really take a lot from this presentation today, have um, disability insurance, have filed, and have currently been denied. So um, thank you so much for everyone for participating. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been extremely helpful. Um, Something kind of, kind of what I predicted and that there'd be people kind of from, uh, on all ranges. Um, to the people who don't have coverage yet, um, I'm going to do my best to kind of direct some, a lot of my commentary toward, um, toward you, but uh, most of what's going to be relevant to you is early on, is when I discuss the difference between ERISA and non-ERISA policies, um, and specifically the, the upside and downside of getting an ERISA policy, or in, in other words, getting um, disability coverage through your employer. Um, and okay. So before I get into um, the presentation itself, there's a few kind of general comments I, I want to make. Um, these disability claims are very personal and everybody's medical situation is very personal um, and I'm going to be giving very general advice. Um, so obviously everything should be not taken with a grain of salt, but make sure you, you are assessing everything in light of your own situation. You know, there is lots of times where someone has a unique situation where things just don't really apply to them. Um, and there'll be a lot of other situations where you'll just be left with questions. Um, please, please, please feel free to email me. I'll give you my contact info. Feel free to email me with any questions you are left with. And we will have this you know, process uh, that Emily will explain afterwards. Um, but if down the line you have a specific issue with your claim, um, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, don't feel like you're bothering me or that it's any form of charity because we do this um, in the natural course of business in assessing claims anyway. Um, and I'm always happy to take time to, to talk to someone and help them out. Um, but simultaneously, if I say throughout the presentation, you know, now it's time to call a lawyer, don't feel like you have to call me. You know, don't feel like I am the only person in the country who can help you. Um, 
I'm certainly not. There are uh, a lot of lawyers out there who who do what what we, we do um, that are really really good at it, and then have put a lot of work in, especially in the MECF MECFS realm. Um, so there, are, you know, don't hesitate to email me um, if you are not in California and have a California issue. I can help you find someone that you want to find. Um, but most importantly, don't be unsettled if you're left with questions, because that's kind of going to be the natural order of this, because these claims can be very complicated. Um, and frankly, a lot of times, if you're in a position where you're getting denied or you're worried about getting denied, a lawyer is probably going to be your next step, whether or not you actually end up hiring someone. Um, the second kind of big point I want to make and, and kind of warn all of you about um, is the bulk of my presentation is not very rosy. It is, I'm not going to give you a lot of good news. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't surprise a lot of you because you are probably not used, you know, you're used to not getting a lot of good news in the, in the battles you've been fighting. Um, but I, I give you this bad news because, you know, good news isn't all that helpful. You know, there's no reason for me to sit here and tell you all the things that could go right. That doesn't protect you. Um, and I tell you all of these things because if you are aware of what you are up against, in my opinion, that is the single best way to basically beat the system, you know, the system that is very much stacked against you. And kind of as I'll explain later, these ERISA disability insurance companies set the claims process up to deny as many people as possible, knowing that a lot of them won't even bother appealing, and that ends up being good business for them. So if you're one of those people who do appeal and you know how to protect your claim, because they're so generally sloppy and errant with their, you know, and and kind of, la um, you know, they're very casual with their denials. If you protect your claim and protect yourself, you could be in a really good position, if not to win the appeal outright, um, to succeed in litigation, which in a lot of ways can be um, beneficial to certain people in certain situations. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, an overview of what we're gonna kind of talk about, I'm gonna start with just disability insurance 101. Um, the very basics of disability insurance and, and what it is, um, you know, it'll just be a slice of all of the aspects of disability insurance, but, you know, I, I don't have time to talk about everything. And, and, you know, one of the pieces of advice I'll be, I'll give will be to read your policy very carefully because that will have everything. Um, the next section, I will talk about the claim submission process, you know, what you should do in submitting a claim, how to support your claim, and what will be really important for us today is exclusions and limitations, what they are, how they apply, um, and what, if anything, you can do to kind of prevent an insurance company from hooking on to one of these exclusions and limitations um, when they shouldn't. Um, I'll discuss a few pitfalls to avoid as well during the claim process, um, and I will also discuss what happens after the claim submission and um, the appeal process and what happens after a claim denial. Okay, so the very basics, um, I'm going to kind of touch upon the difference between short-term and long-term disability, how these insurance companies define disability, um, and, and in other words, what, what status you actually have to be in to be disabled under the terms of the policy. Um, I'm going to explain the difference between ERISA and non-ERISA insurance, um, and again, discuss the exclusions and limitations um, and how insurers may try to limit their exposure um, and pay you less money uh, by relying on these provisions, um, very often in the case of MECFS sufferers wrongfully, as I'll explain. So the, the two general types of private insurance you can get from your employer are short-term and long-term. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time discussing the difference um, or discussing the kind of, you know, unique variances between them um, because long-term disability is pretty universal. There's a lot, I mean, there's differences, but for the most part, no matter where you are in the country, the policies are going to look pretty much the same. Um, with short-term disability, it varies a lot by state, um, and some uh, some states have state disability, and there won't even be a lot of short-term disability offered. Um, 
but it's, it's something to certainly pay attention to because if you have long-term disability, you probably have short-term. And if you intend to purchase long-term, you want to purchase short-term as well because statistically, while this may not apply as strongly to ME-CFS sufferers, uh, maybe it does. Uh, statistically, you're usually disabled for a period of less than a year if you do become disabled. Um, Short-term disability usually lasts six months. It can last up to a year, sometimes two. Um, the benefits are paid on a weekly basis. The, it usually pays up to 70% of your salary. Um, the one of the important things I think to note if you are looking at a long-term disability claim um, is that a lot of people, they're paid short-term disability in full without any problem, and then they're surprised when they get hassled for the long-term. This is because often the short-term is handled by the insurance company, but the benefits are paid for that by the employer. So they're playing with house money. It's not their own money, so they... and it, it's a lot less at stake because it's only six months to a year. Long term, it's more often the insurance company's paying the bill and they have a lot more exposure. So there's a lot more fight at the long term period. Now, we love to use the argument that if someone's paid short term, why aren't they be being paid long term? Nothing's changed. But don't be surprised if you have a very easy time with short term and a much tougher time with long term. Um, long term disability usually pays till. Um, age 65, uh, these days it's often till the social security retirement age, which is closer to 67. Um, as it says, it usually pays between 50 to 70% of your, of your salary on a monthly basis. 60% um, is what I see most often. One thing to pay attention to, especially for those individuals who do not have coverage yet, um, or those who have not made a claim yet, the benefits can be taxable or non-taxable depending on how the premiums are paid. Now I'm not a tax attorney, and I, you know, this is not legal advice. Or this is, you know, this is not to be relied upon the way some of these disability things are to be relied upon. And you should t ch uh, check with a tax attorney or tax uh, professional. Um, but from our understanding, if the employer pays the premium, and or the premium is paid with pre-tax dollars, the benefits are taxable as well, the same way salary would be. If the premiums are paid with post-tax dollars then the benefits are not taxable. So the difference can be pretty big. If you're getting 60% of your salary post-tax, it's not that big of a loss. If you're getting 60% pre-tax, and then that's deducted from you know, taxes are deducted, it can be a much bigger hit. Um, and not all employers offer the ability to do it post-tax, but it's something you should definitely inquire with if you haven't purchased coverage yet. Um, your long-term disability benefits will be reduced by what's called other income. They, different insurance companies call it different things, um, but basically they'll take your benefit and they will reduce it if you receive other disability benefits. State disability, social security disability, workers' comp, sometimes if, if you're injured and you get a settlement, uh, money for that, it, it varies by policy and by state. Um, but you can expect that the system is set up that you will not earn more from being disabled generally um, than you do from working because they don't want to incentivize people to, to file disability claims rather than try and work. Generally, long-term disability policies are broken down into two definitions of disability. For the first two years, and again, the policies vary. Um, some policies don't even have two definitions, but you have to look at your own. But most of them, for the first two years, you're disabled if you can't do your own job. So if you're an ER physician, um, you are disabled if you, you, know, you break your, your left pinky and that means you can't uh, do emergency ER work. You cannot do your own job. Um, Similarly, if you're a heavy warehouse worker and you need to lift 100 pounds and you're injured and you can only lift 90, you're disabled from your own occupation. After that two years, you are only disabled if you are unable to perform any occupation. Now, any occupation is defined differently, again, by state and by policy. Um, but in California, for example, for the most part, it's any job that which you um, you can earn what you are earning on disability and reasonably re be retrained to perform. 
Um, so for someone who is a, let's say a doctor, for example, or an ER doctor who broke their pinky, they may not be able to do their own occupation, but they could certainly be a, you know, a, a doctor of some other kind. So they could do a different similar job that'll earn them enough money so they would not qualify for disability under the any occupation standard. Um, similarly, someone who's got an own occupation that requires them to lift 100 pounds and they can't lift 90, well, after two years, they can certainly do some kind of desk job related to the warehouse work they were doing. Um, now, alternatively, if someone's disabled from their own occupation as a, a doctor because of severe debilitating fatigue, it's going to be pretty hard for an insurance company to find a, an alternate occupation that earns them something close to that that they could do if they're too impaired to be a doctor. So it's, again, it's one of those really case-by-case -case situations as, as far as how much of trouble you may have, um, what we call getting over that any occupation hurdle. Um, and again, you should look at your own policy to see what, what it says. Um, and for those who don't have coverage yet, if you do get coverage, read the policy. Um, you pr usually do not have any options as far as changing this or editing this or making the own occupation period longer um, if you get coverage through your employer. You can certainly do that if you get coverage through a broker, um, but for sufferers of MECFS, that's often out of the question because the underwriting makes the um, premiums just too high, which is one of the benefits of group insurance as I'll discuss. So, disability, the difference between ERISA and non-ERISA is, is significant. ERISA, um, since we've been using the word and not defining it yet, which is probably a mistake, um, ERISA is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It is a federal law which originally was designed to protect pensions through a series of what we call awful mistakes by the Supreme Court, it has significantly broadened to cover all employee benefits. Even worse, um, and well, I'll discuss that in a minute, but so it, it, instead of state law applying to your disability insurance claim, if you get your coverage through your employer, it'll be governed by this federal law. Um, uh, Note, if you happen to be employed by a government or a church organization um, and you get coverage through your employer, it's still governed by state law because there's an exemption under ERISA for government or church organizations. Um, alternatively, if you get coverage through a broker and not through your employer, uh, the policy will be governed by state law. So. There's a lot here, but the, the biggest benefit of getting coverage through your employer, first, it may be the only option for, for a lot of you because, again, if you try and get coverage through a, a broker, they can do underwriting and they can do, you know, medical history and assess considering your medical history, how, you know, what the risk is with, with insuring you and, and charge you accordingly. If you get coverage through your employer, there is no individual underwriting. So you don't need to show any medical history, any proof of, uh, um, you know, of eligibility, anything like that. They just give coverage. Sometimes you have to show if you want to buy up or get an upgrade to that coverage, you may have to show evidence of insurability. Um, but the base level coverage you can get without having to get any, any kind of medical underwriting. That is huge, especially with people with a significant medical history. Um, so often that's your only option. If it is, you have to be aware of what you're getting into. The big problem with ERISA is that it prevents people like you who are wrongfully denied insurance benefits from obtaining any benefits outside of what the insurance company owes to date and potentially some attorney's fees. So it's pretty much the equivalent of if the law was set up that if you robbed a bank and stole 100 grand, the only way you'd get in any kind of trouble is if the government sued you successfully, won, and then the only thing that would happen to you is you'd have to pay 100 grand and maybe 20 or 30% of that on top. If that were the law, how many bank robbers do you think would be out there? Probably a lot more than there are now, and at least I certainly think so. And that's the system that is set up for these ERISA insurers is that they are not exposed to any damages outside of what they already owe you. And they only have to pay you up to date. 
So they can, you know, they lose in trial, they can pay you to date, and the next week send you back to another examination to start the process all over again. So this is the reason ERISA insureds face a much more uphill climb than similar, you know, similar people who have bought insurance through a private broker. It's tough for everyone because it is bad business. It's good business for them to be bad to be bad to you, basically, because there's very little risk in denying you. And they deny people by the you know, by the tens of thousands, knowing only a fraction will even do anything, because they know most people don't even bother appealing when they get denied. So it's hard for everyone, and it's even harder for people with you know conditions like MECFS because it gives them so many opportunities, more opportunities to try and justify a denial and you know throw wool over a, a, a you know a confused judge's eyes. So this is also one of the reasons you probably won't you don't find a lot of ERISA lawyers out there compared to other areas of law, especially insurance bad faith, um, because the only way to really be successful as an ERISA lawyer is to be able to win is you you have to be able to go all the way and win um, and it's a very niche area of law which requires you to know it pretty in depth so it's a very kind of specialized area with not a lot of damages upside um which again is one of the reasons it's it's harder to find an ERISA attorney than it is the to find you know a, P, a personal injury attorney or a divorce lawyer or something like that um, oh, one thing i do want to mention for those who if you have already been denied and you have not appealed yet, you must, must, must appeal before the deadline prescribed in the denial letter. You can ask for an extension in writing if you need more time. And if they give that to you in writing, that is totally fine. But without that, you have to meet the deadline on that denial letter. There is some awful case law out there which basically prohibits you from filing a lawsuit if you miss the deadline and they decide not to review the appeal. It's it's awful, but you have to be really careful. So if anything you remember from today is do not miss the appeal deadline that is prescribed in your denial letter. So if you get um, insurance coverage through a broker, again, this is all different from ERISA, uh, they, insurance companies face the prospect of serious damages if they deny you wrongfully. You know, if they deny you, if they, if they deprive you of a hundred thousand dollars, they could be tacked for a million by a jury. So insurance companies who are not subject to ERISA in states with good, bad faith, bad faith insurance law, like California are much, much, much more careful than ERISA insurers. Yeah, I can tell you, I've had um, at least four or five opportunities to have a claimant with an ERISA policy and a non-ERISA policy with the same insurance company at the same time, and they're done separately, and they're, like, they're two separate entities, and it is, is unbelievable seeing how different each one is. Um, they've stopped doing them separately now because they know that we like to use them against each other, but once you get the opportunity to see it, I mean... It, it's pretty incredible just how poorly the system is set up for ERISA insureds. Um, so that's basically the, the, the general basics of what disability insurance is. Um, and you know, for those without coverage, before I move on to what you actually do when you submit a claim, um, the, 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 the basic truth is that there's not a lot you can do about what you're offered. You know, if you have an employer, um, and they offer coverage, you should try and get it and get it without medical underwriting because often there is not a better opportunity to get coverage for a cheaper price um, or a, a reasonable price even because of, of medical underwriting. Um, if you're choosing a employer based potentially on the disability benefits they offer, good for you. I mean, the, the, the foresight's really incredible. Um, uh, I can't, I don't know what question, you know, what advice I could give without kind of answering a very specific question. But if you happen to be choosing between companies or choosing between employers, um, please feel free to email me. Um, but generally, I find that people who, if you're given an opportunity to get the coverage, get it the first opportunity you can. Um, and if you have the chance, t talk to your HR department about whether um, you can make it um, non-taxable because if you do end up using it, it makes the makes the benefits a lot more valuable. Um, so for those who are 
considering submitting a claim um, or have already submitted a claim because those who have already submitted a claim certainly have more time to, to supplement, um, especially if you haven't been denied yet. Um, the first thing you should do is start with the policy. Um, I, I'm using the words plan and policy kind of interchange, interchangeably. They're the same thing. For our legal purposes, a policy is individual insurance and a plan is a ERISA group insurance, but um, again, it doesn't really matter. Um, but always look at your policy. Look at it very carefully. Make sure you understand what is in it. If you don't, you know, email me or another lawyer and ask. Uh, it's really important that you understand the coverage you have. Um, when you're looking at the policy, pay attention to exclusions and limitations. Understand, you know, what they are and what they say, and keep them in the back of your mind as you're building your claim or as you're supporting your claim. I know that doesn't necessarily make sense right now, but it will in a second. Um, I'll also discuss how to provide the best evidence to support your claim, um, focusing a lot on two-day cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, also discuss a few pitfalls um, that we can avoid. Emily, what time did we start? In line? Okay, fine. Um, oh, hello. Sorry. Hi, sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, we started at about five after, so okay. um, we, we still have plenty of time. Okay, great. Um, okay, so as I said, read your planner policy. Um, if you don't have it, ask for it from your employer or insurance company in any kind of trackable method. If you don't get a response within 35 days, send another and keep doing that till you get a response. It can be helpful down the road legally um, because it's really important that you show that you were able to get those documents or to be able to show that you weren't able to get them. But usually we don't, employers don't cause a lot of trouble and they, they provide those documents easily. Um, okay, so there are three general types of exclusions and limitations. I'm just going to describe what they are right now, um, and I'll describe how to deal with them a little bit later. Um, but ironically, the one that applies the least to you is the one that's going to be the most dangerous, and that is these mental nervous limitations. Um, they're what we call in the industry mental nervous limitations. Um, they're basically mental health disability limitations, um, where you only get a certain amount of benefits, usually two years, if the disability is caused by a mental health issue. As I'm sure some of you can kind of see where this is going, insurance companies love to try to limit their exposure by painting um, ME-CFS as a mental health issue. Um, they, they love doing it to, to lots of different issues, not just ME-CFS, but considering, you know, the, the the, the newer nature of the illness and the, and the lack of understanding in the medical community, it gives them a lot more opportunity to try and just call the fatigue depression-related fatigue. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, seen it called depression-related fatigue or something similar to that. Um, the two other types um, of, of exclusions and limitations, um, it's basically an objective evidence requirement slash subjective symptom limitation. What this really is, it's a it's it's insurance company's way of trying to demand evidence that you cannot provide. So there will be clauses that say you must provide objective evidence of your disability. Any you know this is of what objective evidence is. Nothing else will be accepted. Um, I'll go into how why those are problematic later. Um, but thankfully, we are seeing a lot less of these limitations, and we are building a lot more objective evidence of MECFS. So these these concerns are, are, are becoming a lot fewer and far in between, thankfully. Um, the last one are MECFS and chronic fatigue limitations, which explicitly limit the amount of benefits you can receive um, if your disability is caused by MECFS or um, a chronic fatigue illness. Um, again, ironically, while this would seem to be the, the biggest threat to, to all of you out there, I am not seeing a lot of MECFS or chronic fatigue limitations out there yet. Um, they're pretty rare, and what's better is that they are really, really poorly written. Um, as, I'll, as I'll explain a bit more, um, the insurance companies um, 
they will rely on old definitions of MECFS and chronic fatigue syndrome, the CDC definition. So a lot of times the limitations are written based on those. Um, and so you can get around them pretty easily. So this is just background about a, a mental nervous limitation. Just about every policy will have a limitation like this. Um, the one thing to pay special attention to is whether it says disabilities due to or disabilities caused and contributed to by. Um, the caused and contributed to by language makes it a lot harder to fight that exclusion um, because all the insurance company has to show is that your the mental health issues contribute to the disability. And you know, depending on your state, it depends on how um, that is interpreted. Um, so, you know. Insurance companies know that just about 90% of people become disabled or become depressed when they're disabled. Um, so again, they use this limitation a lot more than just on MECFS sufferers, um, but it's it's something to be aware of. And I'll discuss in a bit how you can prevent that from being used against you. So this is again, more detail on the objective evidence and self-reported system requirements. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this. Um, the most important thing to pay attention to is if there is an objective symptom limitation, make sure you are doing your best to provide the exact information they want. And this is, it's probably an opportunity to talk to a lawyer about how in your state they deal with objective evidence requirements. Um, also, very often they use the objective evidence requirement, but it's not actually in the policy. They'll, they'll deny you saying there's no objective evidence of disability, even though that's not an explicit requirement. Um, and that's often something we can use uh, successfully to fight. Self-reported symptom limitations, uh, we don't really see them very often anymore. Um, and they're pretty easy to fight. But if you're denied based on one of these, you, you, sh you should be talking to a lawyer because it's, you know, the, the language itself often becomes what the, the is easiest to attack. So again, MECFS limitations, they're, they're pretty rare um, and they're often very poorly written. But if you have one, um, again, it's time, you should probably be consulting with a lawyer because it takes a lot of nuance and, and talent to kind of, you know, strategize about how you would, you know, how you get around this. You know, I have one a, a situation where um, I have a client who is suffering from MECFS and a bunch of other issues, um, and there is a limitation like this in there, but it's it's so poorly written that uh, you know we decided to just move forward without worrying about it in a sense, and that we're going to argue it legally if they decide to deny on that down the road. Um, I mean, there's a lot more detail that I, I can't share, but it's it's one of those things where it does take a lot of nuance um, to figure out how to best approach it. Um, and not just with these limitations, um, but what you'll find is that insurance companies are still using the CDC definition um, of MECFS, and which is most notably is they're using it as a diagnosis of exclusion. This can be helpful to you, this can be harmful to you, depending on how you're utilizing it and what the doctors, um, what the insurance company doctors have actually said about it. Um, but again, you won't be surprised to hear that they are very much behind the times. Um, and if you get a denial based on 30 year old medical outdated medical science, well, that's just kind of par for the course in these ERISA claims. Um, again, the, po if the policy itself does not define CFS in these MECFS limitations. Many states will assume in a, a definition which is beneficial to you. Um, that's definitely the case in California, but it depends on where you are. Okay, so how to support your claim. I'm just gonna put this all out there. This is probably the most important part and what everyone can kind of take something out of. So first, what, you're, what you need for a disability claim, whatever, and this is what everyone needs. First is your doctor's records. Now this says all doctor's records with an asterisk. You don't have to give them all of your doctor's records, but what to give them will kind of depend on what the result of your first step, which is actually ordering 
your doctor's records. So one of the first things you should do is get them and review them yourself because you can't tell you how many times where what you think is in those records just is not. And if you have records you're missing critical information, you can discuss with your doctor trying to either get that info in there or get a letter kind of supplementing everything. Um, especially for ME-CFS sufferers, and it's, you know, it's, it's the hard truth is that there are way too many doctors out there who, you know, don't fully believe you. And, you know, you'll see a doctor not realize till the fourth or fifth appointment that they just don't, they're not, they're supporting you. They think it's in your head as well. Um, so you want to be aware of those problems early on. Um, so you have kind of a handle because there's nothing worse than an insurance company having, you know, records from two doctors you thought were supportive, which basically says that they don't think there's any physical or biological problem. Um, again, and these things don't happen all that often. Most people do have a decent enough rapport with their doctors that, they, that, that that's not the result. But, you know, these are the things I have to warn you about. Um, you'll also need an attending physician. Uh, you'll need a job description, but you, they usually get that from from the employer. Um, you'll need an attending physician statement and claimant questionnaire or claimant questionnaire. What this really is, is you need support from your doctor. Your doctor has to sign off on your disability. Um, it is impossible to get a claim off the ground without a doctor's support. In the same vein, it is really hard to maintain a claim if they are able to kind of convince your doctor that you aren't disabled or convince them that their opinion is right. Um, so it's very important to kind of keep a strong relationship with your doctor and keep aware of any hiccups in that relationship. Um, again, it's rare, but it, it does happen. Um, and make sure your doctors, when they're filling out these statements, are sending them to you to send an insurance company. You don't want to get ambushed with a mistake or something unhelpful um, that a doctor sent in because it's really hard to undo that. Um, so jumping down a little bit to must have for ME-CFS claimants, because that's, I think, what's really important today. Um, the best evidence we are using is two-day CPAT um, that is custom designed for disability purposes. There are two labs we know about that perform it up to standard that we are able to use. Um, Workwell Foundation in California, and Betsy Keller runs a lab in Ithaca College. Um, I know, I, I'm, I'm sure there are other labs that do two-day CPET. I have not found any which are anywhere near as cost-effective or that have the um, what we call um, validity testing to confirm the actual results. Um, so without those things, it, the test isn't nearly supportive. And so we send every client basically to a two-day CPAT um, because it is the best objective evidence we have of, of disability caused by fatigue. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be you know, an ME-CFS cause. Any cause of debilitating fatigue will show up on this two-day CPAT. Um, and we've had uh, tons of success in, in, in court and with the insurance companies and in getting in denials overturned by using this CPAT, uh, this two-day CPAT. Um, do not let this confuse you with one-day CPAT or exercise stress testing. They are different things. One-day CPAT's not supported for disability. Um, and the stress testing is more to die, you know, it's not the kind of measurements we need to explain the extent of disability. Um, so if you can, uh, two-day CPET is, is the best way to support your claim if you haven't gotten it already. Um, if you get a CPET, there's a ton of peer-reviewed science that they will give you wherever you get it done to send in along with it. Um, you also want to try and get a letter from your physician reviewing the CPET, saying that they agree with it, saying that it's good science, and saying that it is totally in line with um, all of your complaints. Um, another, you know, and to to pause for a second. So the CPET is different from say lab results and lab tests because, well, lab tests are wonderful and they help us prove the existence of the source of a problem. Um, they do not show the extent of a disability. So often they'll say, the insurance company will say, yeah, we acknowledge the existence of the condition. We do not see anything that supports the extent of it. Um, so that can often give us some problems. So you want to, um, that's one of the reasons that you want two-day CPET. And you also want things like explanatory letters. And um, one thing I really like are journals. 
um, a, a detailed journal of three to four weeks of your life, good and bad, showing them the good days and the bad days to give them a real picture of what your life is like. Um, this serves a dual purpose into kind of showing them why on a daily basis you can't work. And also if you get surveilled and they see you on a good day and you have a journal which highlights that good day, it helps you explain around it, explain, yeah, that was a good day. The next four days I was you know, in bed and couldn't get out. Um, also great to obtain if you can, if you have cognitive issues, a neuropsychological evaluation is probably the best evidence you can submit if it's supportive. Um, they can be expensive to pay for out of pocket. Um, we always prefer these things are paid for out of pocket if you can, because then if it's not helpful, it doesn't get submitted through insurance and the insurance company doesn't get it. But we also know that's not always feasible. Um, a, a, a newer piece of evidence that I still have not sent a claimant to yet is an IC pet. Um, it involves, you know, uh, instilling a uh, arterial line to measure the the more specific source of a disability. Um, but because the source of the disability isn't usually the big question, I haven't had a, a reason to send anyone to this yet. Um, but if your doctors recommend it and you do end up getting it, make sure you have um, someone like Betsy Keller at Ithaca to explain the results um, so they can explain why this means disability. Um, a, another good piece of evidence to have, if you're getting Social Security, um, it is almost always good to submit the Social Security award, but be warned, make sure you know on what grounds you were awarded Social Security. If you were awarded Social Security on mental health issues, um, the insurance company could use that to try and limit your claim where they otherwise couldn't. Um, it's also good to put in personal statements from family and friends. Um, performance reviews can show either that your performance slipped before you stopped working and that you know you were, your condition was actually being impacted. Or if your performance reviews were stellar, um, it can show that you had no reason to stop working other than that you couldn't. Um, so these are all pieces of evidence you can kind of provide to, to help your case along. Um, you know, one thing, if you are seeing a mental health professional, you can send in a, a letter from a mental health professional, but the wording of this can be really important. Um, you want the doctor to say, I believe my client, uh, my patient is disabled from her chronic fatigue. She is depressed because of her chronic fatigue. I don't think she's disabled because of the depression. Um, and I think you know her opinion, her her complaints are credible. So you want to make sure that the the letter is is mindful of these limitations I was talking about previously. Um, so this is just a sample of an older um, attending physician statement. Um, don't feel the need to have your doctor stick to the form. Um, if your doctor wants to explain more fully, they are welcome to put in an attachment. Make sure they carefully read the things like physical impairment. Um, you know, you want them checking the class five box, not the class four box, because the class five box says you can still, the class four box says you can still work. Um, so these things need to be looked at very carefully um, and reviewed before they're sent into the insurance company. You know, if you're dealing with your, with your treating physician, you know, this isn't much of an issue for MECFS. Um, claimants as much because you've already vetted most of your doctors so well can you, because the only people who can actually help you are the ones who are ultra qualified. Um, but be a good patient, you know, be as good of a patient as you can, be honest with your doctor. Um, you know, some lawyers say don't belabor disability issues before you're ready to make a claim. You know, my personal opinion is I want honesty. Whatever you actually feel or think, tell your doctor what you feel or think because it, the more important thing is the supportive narrative. Um, than you know, having the perfect picture, in my opinion. Um, this is just an example of a form they'll have you fill out. Um, this is a basic insurance form to kind of describe your activities. Again, don't feel the need to be limited to this um, because you can also add a supplement or a statement whenever you want to. Um, you know, if you are sent to specialists by your treating physician, go see them. Again, be the most compliant patient you can um, because that helps, you know, the entire narrative look better and helps you get the the evidence that you need. And in a lot of cases, people are worried about, you know, I don't really go want to go get this test done. It's not going to show anything. Again, in my opinion, 
I'd rather you be going and getting tests and getting stuff done to try and figure out what's wrong and it not be not show up than you not doing anything because you know again it makes the narrative seem more believable that you are doing your best to figure out what is wrong with you even in in you know it takes sometimes 10 or 15 tests before the 16th which actually shows what's going on um so a little bit more about uh, the two-day CPAT. Um, this is kind of the, the 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 scientific details about how it works. It's a two-day test. Um, but if you if you're ready to get CPAT, you can email me and I'll give you more information about this. I want to make sure I get to the some other the end stuff. Um, okay, some pitfalls to avoid. Do not communicate with the insurance company orally if you can avoid it. Always communicate in a trackable form in writing, which is fax, email, uh, certified mail, anything you can track. Um, if you do have to communicate in orally, if they force it on you, write a letter after confirming the conversation. Give them 10 days to clarify or correct if they think it's wrong um, because you want to make sure you've documented everything they've actually told you because, you know, along with insurance companies not – you know, denying claims all over the place, they don't invest into training their people because they don't need to. So these people don't know what's going on and they're not really afraid to kind of just make stuff up to get keep their day going along. The, the turnover rate of these insurance companies is through the roof and the only people who don't quit are the ones who have shown themselves to enjoy and excel at terminating people's disability benefits. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a company full of people that you're gonna look forward to dealing with. Um, be careful about overstating your restrictions and limitations. Never use, um, you know, never use the word never, never use the word always. Always qualify. This is usually easier with MECFS patients because, you, you know, a lot of you have good and bad days. So you, you start with that. You know, I have good and bad days. My bad days are really bad. Um, but make sure you don't overstate because you, you can assume you will be surveilled at some point. Um, if not just on social media, they'll surveil you in person. They do it all the time. Um, you cannot avoid it. I mean, all you can do is avoid being a superhero in public, and you can be honest. You know, if you tell them, when I have a good day, I garden for 15 minutes, and they catch you on surveillance gardening for 15 minutes, I love that. I love seeing that. I, I almost prefer that to someone who, you know, was never, never does anything, has never seen doing anything. Because people who are truly disabled don't just give up and stay disabled. They try and get back on their feet. They try, and their doctors tell them, try and keep exercising, try, try and keep working. So, you know, to me, I, I want, I, what I want to see is, is a real person really trying their best. And so, and if an insurance company wants to use that against you, they're going to have a really hard time. Um, assume your social media will be examined. They will look at your social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, everything. Okay. Um, I, you know, I usually tell people to try and just avoid posting at all. I know that's not always a reasonable request in this day and age, but at the very least post as if everyone's watching you know assume you're gonna be seen that doesn't mean posting every day about how awful you feel um but it, it does mean not going out of your way to be a superhero and appear to be living your best life as so many people love to do on social media um again uncooperative attending physicians you all probably have more experience in this than most of my of my uh clients do um but be careful that doctors you know don't always put in the records what they say they do make sure your doctor you know is actually supportive make sure they understand that if they get a call from the insurance company they should put the response in writing and give it to you to respond um but again keep your relationship with your doctors strong because they are your best evidence and your best support I kind of just went over all these things uh, without showing the slides. So with, um, again, with the overstating restrictions, limitations, the only way an insurance company can justify a denial is by trashing your credibility. What they're going to say is you're lying. You're not actually disabled. Don't give them an opportunity to actually justify that. If your credibility stays intact, it makes it very hard for an insurance company to actually succeed in trial um, if you've done everything right to support the medical aspect. Social media, it is 
dangerous, but do not appear, you know, do your best not to be a superhero in public and on social media. Again, I, every single case I have, every single one has social media, a social media background report in it. There's not always video surveillance. There is always a social media report. So be aware of that. Okay. So once you actually submit the claim, the insurance company is going to order medical records and have your medical records reviewed by one of their in-house, you know, using air quotes over here, hack doctors. Um, these people are basically the bottom of the barrel because only the only real doctors who are going to work for insurance companies doing paper reviews are ones who can't be doing anything else. These people don't really treat patients. They don't do any research. They are mostly all bought and paid for insurance company doctors. Some are even insurance company employees. So the conflicts of interest are just, they're very ripe. Um, and a lot of these people only get paid by insurance companies, so they want to keep their employer happy. Um, you will get a report um, from this peer review, what we call peer review doctor. Um, and it, it will either say that you are not disabled and here's an opportunity to review and respond, um, or it'll say that you, you have to go to an independent medical examination and they can uh, send you to an in-person exam rather than just having your medical records reviewed by a medical professional. Um, in my experience, if any of you people out there are sent to a IME, and it is not a, and I, I've still not seen this, it's not a MECFS specialist who you know and is you know well-respected in the community, which it never is, um, it's time to talk to a lawyer uh, to get kind of a handle on what's going on and to see if, if you can get some help because the IME, when they send an MECFS sufferer to an IME, they know what they're doing. They're setting you up for a denial because they know and a one-hour physical exam is not going to show the ex probably any of your issues potentially, certainly not going to show the extent of your fatigue. Um, so that's something to certainly be aware of. The insurance company is allowed to. Um, there's nothing you can really do to avoid it. Um, if they send you to someone three hours away, you can push back. But again, you should be probably talking to an attorney at that point. Um, let's see. If for whatever reason, their doctors believe that you actually do have some limitations, they'll take those limitations and give them to an occupational specialist to see if you can do a job, your own job or any job under the terms of the policy given your limitations. That person will only use the limitations given to them by the insurance company doctors. Um, so don't be surprised if this whole, you, you see this occupational report and it only utilizes the insurance company doctors. Um, so at some point you'll either get an approval or a denial. Um, the timing is, is uh, they technically have 90 days to make a decision on an appeal, um, but the, the law is a little complicated on that. Um, but if you are denied, you will get a right to appeal. As I said before, do not miss that appeal right, uh, that appeal deadline. It is extremely important. Um, it's usually 180 days, it can be less. Um, request a copy of your claim file in writing immediately when you are denied. The claim file will have everything you need in it and everything a lawyer will need to assess your claim. Um, go back to your policy and check if you have one or two appeals. Um, if you've got two appeals, um, it's, it's good to know because you can maybe appeal on your own and you, you know you'll have a second bite at the apple. You usually only get one. This is usually the time I tell people to talk to a lawyer if you've been denied, um, because a full assessment of the claim file is the only way you know a, a, someone can really counteract a denial. Um, but for the most part, the what you do is you just focus on the mistakes when you you're writing a, a, an appeal letter. Um, this is kind of a, a quick sample of, of an intro. Um, we. You know, we recommend when you when you provide the appeal, you kind of summarize the prior letters and documents. And some lawyers will tell you to point out the mistakes in the insurance company's um, medical reports and vocational reports. Um, and big obvious mistakes, that's probably true. Um, but be careful. If you're going to proceed on your own and not hire an attorney, or at least consult with an attorney, be very careful about pointing out every mistake they've made because it often, in our experience, ends up being less of a persuasive argument 
and more of a roadmap to how to do the next denial better and how to plug all the holes that you've shown in your appeal letter. Um, so it can be kind of counterproductive to actually point out every problem in the appeal and in the medical reports. But again, you know, once you're appealed, it's, it's usually worth your time to talk to an attorney um, who offers free consultations. And again, if you've been denied, you're well, more welcome than to email me with a denial letter. Um, and I'm happy to, to give you my feedback. Um, you know, for example, if they have a, an OBGYN review your claim um, and concluded that because there's no labs, you're not disabled, even though there's 15 pages of labs over, you know, from last week, um, those are big things you can point out. But again, it, you never know when they're just going to turn around, fix it, and make the next denial better. So what we usually tell people is focus on getting better evidence. Focus on getting better testing, getting a CPET, having your doctor respond to their doctors, having new doctors respond to their doctors. You want to have as many medical professionals making medical arguments as possible. And you want to try and limit what you're doing to mistakes about you. You know, they say you were traveling for fun when you really weren't, or they say you were somewhere and you weren't, or they say they saw you on video, but it wasn't you. Those things should be corrected. Um, but these are all considerations to weigh when, when drafting an appeal letter. Um, and yeah, if you provide new evidence, enclose them, summarize them, and how they address the problems with the prior denial. And, and again, so the best evidence to provide, to provide is, is new medical evidence, you know, whether it's tests, labs, or specific rebuttals from your physician or even a new physician, an independent physician, um, can all be helpful in providing new evidence. But the best thing you want to put in there is evidence. You know, a lot of people just will write a letter explaining why everything's wrong, but not providing anything new. The letter is a drop in the bucket compared to the power of actual evidence that you're providing. So again, when, you know, if you are denied, we usually recommend that you seek counsel, find someone who offers free consultations. All of you are lucky in that you've already found someone. I do. I'm always willing to, to give you feedback on a denial letter. Um, we are in California, but we, you know, we can, we can represent people all over the country. But again, I know a lot of great lawyers in other states, um, you know, who are eager to help people. And again, just don't be uh, shy about emailing me. Um, sometimes, um, you know, it's often in your best interest to get a contingency lawyer. Sometimes it's not. If you know, sometimes if you can pay a lawyer twenty five hundred bucks to write a good appeal letter and get your claim paid, that's a lot better than having to pay fifteen percent for the next several years. Um, so be pay attention when you're making that decision. Um, if you're denied, you can you can write to the Department of Insurance. We don't always recommend it. Um, we often find that they don't do anything. Um, and it just gives the insurance company an opportunity to write another letter explaining their denial. So again, I, I would um, urge caution before writing the Department of Insurance, um, at least talk to a lawyer first if you can. Um, if the appeal is denied, the next step uh, is usually litigation. You obtain the claim file again and you file a complaint um, and you go from there. And so that is, sorry, I kind of got rushed at the end there. I realized I had a, a, a little bit over time and a lot more information in there that I could, I could cover. Um, but again, I'm sure there are holes um, in, in the knowledge that you're all out there seeking. I am more than happy to answer at least follow-up questions and looking forward to um, answering your questions now, actually. So um, thank you for, for your time. I really, again, really do appreciate you listening to me talk for an hour in a row. And um, I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Cantor. That was a um, fantastic amount of information summarized and, and as, as concisely and simply as I think possible. Um, so we have tons of questions coming in and I've tried to consolidate them um, as, as clearly as I can. And um, just to let everyone know, I think we're gonna answer these questions. And again, Mr. Cantor has so kindly agreed to stay longer. So um, we'll get through as many, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as we can. And any questions that we don't answer, we'll make sure to follow up with you um, afterwards. So um, I think I, I, I consolidated these into approximately 10 questions. Uh, Andrew, I hope this, this is, um, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, let's do it. All right. 
Um, okay, so the first question, I consolidated a couple questions in one. Um, so the first question is, what if I am unemployed, self-employed, or a student, does ERISA apply to me? Unemployed, self-employed, or student. Okay, so unemployed or a student, the answer is definitely no. Um, if you're unemployed, you may still have access to state disability in your state um, or Social Security disability, depending on how long you've been unemployed. Um, neither of those are government benefits, so neither of those are governed by ERISA. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know of any student disability insurance out there, um, but I can tell you student health benefits. Um, I'm hmm, student health. I don't believe student health benefits are governed by ERISA um, because it's it's not employer provided, but it's group insurance. Um, so I can't say for certain with students. Self-employed is a whole bucket of questions as far as if if you're self-employed and you don't have, and you haven't set up a disability policy for your business entity, ERISA won't apply to you. Um, if you do set up a disability insurance policy for your business entity, if you're self-employed and it's only you, you probably are not governed by ERISA, but it, it, I, I have not looked into that specific area of ERISA in a long time. Um, but if you're setting up a policy where you as the owner of the self-employed entity is there's also other employees who are part of that plan ERISA should govern um, but that's a very case specific question as far as self-employed um, and that's definitely something that it's worth looking talking to a lawyer if you're if you're if you're curious about setting up that kind of policy or plan wonderful thank you um the next question uh is is um, about more broadly than MECFS is um, does this process apply to other conditions I have in addition to MECFS, such as so Sjogren syndrome or other autoimmune conditions that are commonly comorbid with MECFS? So when you say does does the same process apply? Um, if you're asking in the most general sense, absolutely. In that you know you file a claim and you get your doctors to support you, you know you get evidence to support your limitations. Um, the um, and the comorbid conditions should always be taken into account, just you know, just like MECFS would. The the distinction comes in um, if there are limitations I didn't discuss today. Sometimes there are autoimmune limitations, um, or if there are self-reported symptom limitations, they can kind of loop in with the comorbid conditions. Um, so. It's, that's kind of a case specific question, but generally, yes, is that you'll kind of go through the same process, you'll have the same concerns, um, and the only really thing you'd have to pay attention to is whether there's um, any kind of exclusion or limitation which applies to any of the comorbid conditions you have. Um, in fact, you know, the last, I remember a Sun Life policy that had a, 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 a weird musculoskeletal limitation, but it excluded Sjogren's from the limitation. So it, it, it acknowledged Sjogren's as serious enough um, that it didn't fall in the limitation, but that was a policy from, I think, 2003. So, you know, who knows if, if that still exists. Um, but yes, certainly still applies to the same comorbids, but take a look at any exclusions and limitations. If there is something that applies to what you have, you know, as I said earlier, pay close attention to whether the exclusion says we will only pay two years for disabilities due to your condition or disabilities caused or contributed to by your condition. Um, you know, one's a lot easier to prove than the other for an insurance company. Um, but yeah, and if you have specific questions about, about that issue, or you get a denial that's related to that, please, you know, feel free to email me. Wonderful. Um, our next question comes from Michael. Michael asks, is it reasonable to obtain an attorney before filing the initial claim? So I, I have this discussion at least once or twice a week with a potential client. It's a great question. And the unfortunately, the answer is, as lawyers love to say, it depends. Um, so it's what we use, what I usually say, if you've got an ERISA claim, um, and there isn't an issue about you getting fired and when your actual date of disability is, because if you're fired, your coverage ends 
and the insurance company will claim you've lost your coverage before you became disabled, even if you were fired because of your disability. So that's one issue that you probably, or any kind of coverage related issues, eligibility, you almost certainly do want to seek counsel before you file uh, the claim. Especially, you know, if you can talk to someone who offers free consults like we do, then, you know, no skin off your back. It's, it's certainly something you should do. But to retain an attorney, if there's not any of those coverage issues and you don't have an attorney who's actually identified something you need to address right off the bat, which we do sometimes, you know, often enough, um, and the, the issues are purely substantive as to, you know, proving the substance of your disability. Um, I usually tell people it's worth giving it a shot on your own first. Um, because, and, you know, having what I use is have me review the forms to make sure you haven't made any huge errors. Um, because with ERISA, because you get an appeal, um, we can add any evidence in we need after the appeal. And we also will often have a better sense of what they're doing to deny you if we're, you know, once you have a denial. So sometimes, you know, we don't even know if there's going to be a problem if we're representing you before you've even filed the claim. Um, but again, that's also in the context of us because we are contingency attorneys. So I don't want someone to pay me a percentage of their benefit um, if they can go get it themselves, especially if I'm willing to like give you the basic, basic help for free. Um, but that's a different, you know, if you've got an attorney who will, who will guide you along for 2,500 bucks and you're looking at a $10,000 a month benefit, you know, that's probably certainly worth it, even if just for the, for the, the, the peace of mind. So that's all to say that there's a, a few different considerations as to whether or not to hire an attorney early on. Um, it's something I'm happy to discuss with you if you've got certain, certain specifics you're, you've got in mind. Um, there's really no downside to it, uh, but it's it's often not necessary. You know, if you are, you know, if you're someone who, if you live alone um, and you don't have the physical energy to do it, and like you don't have the energy to read all the letters and to respond timely, then yeah, that that's a good situation to do it. Um, I often also tell people with severe mental health issues that it's worth it to let me handle it right off the bat because they often come back to me in six months saying my condition's getting worse because they're making me miserable. Um, so for that reason too, it's, it's sometimes worth hiring a lawyer, um, but again, it, it really does depend and there's no hard and fast rule one way or the other. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so this next question comes from Scott. Uh, my claim proved, but with limitations because it was quote, self-reported, unquote, yeah. mm -hmm. is that a denial? Yes. So I say yes, it's a great question. Um, it's actually a, so the question you should be asking, not to be pompous, it's a great question, is not whether it's a denial, but whether you have to appeal right now, because that's the question that we ask. So for example, right, um, it's, it's July 25th, 2019. Um, let's say the insurance company sends you a letter saying, we just reviewed all your medical records. And as of, you know, you filed a claim a month ago, we think you're disabled from mental health issues. Well, wait, I'm not, I have MECFS. That's absurd. Right. Um, but the question is, do I need to appeal right now? Because there's still two years left. You know, if I get, if I get, God forbid, hit by a bus in 18 months and become paraplegic, they're not going to apply that that clause anymore. And because I still have benefits left, I'm now disabled from physical issues and I still get my benefits. And that all goes to say that the denial on a limitation isn't formal until the limitation runs because right up to the end of that limitation, your situation could change and your condition could not be self-reported up to that. Um, so in a different insurance companies handle it differently. So what I think is the best thing usually to do, you know, read the denial letter first. The denial letter will probably say, it'll say one of two things. It will say, this is our decision. You have X amount of time to appeal this decision. And thus, then you should, what I would advise is appeal it and then say, I also believe I deserve a right to appeal this once the limitation runs and I'm denied in final again. Um, the letter could also say, this is our decision right now we are paying you under this limitation but you don't have a right to appeal yet because the limitation hasn't run um so the first thing to do is is the safest thing to do is look at the letter if they tell you to appeal appeal if they don't tell you to appeal ask them if you need to appeal now in writing 
um, because you think you know it's a it's a it's an adverse benefit decision, which is a, a, a phrase you should use. It's an adverse benefit determination, which um, justifies uh, your right to the claim file. And that's another thing you should definitely request the claim file, um, and and see what they say. If they say we're not giving you the claim file because there hasn't been a denial yet, well. You know, it's it's frustrating that you can't appeal right now, but you'll definitely have the right to appeal when they actually tr dry up the benefit or when they actually terminate it. Um, they might give you a chance to appeal twice, appeal now and appeal then. Um, but again, yeah, the safest way to go about it is if the appeal, if the denial letter tells you that you need to appeal by a certain date, do it and then ask for the right to appeal again when the benefits run. If the letter does not give you any right to appeal, ask for a right to appeal and the claim file. And if they say yes, go ahead and appeal. If they say no, then you have it in writing that you don't have to appeal right now. And this is something that, you know, please feel free to email me the, the letter itself if it's hard to navigate because, you know, I, I speak like it's super easy for you to just pick up the letter and read it. But between the, 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 the complexity of ERISA and the sloppiness of claim reps which make just typos and errors all the time they can often be hard to parse so it's a great question and, and that's kind of the advice i'd give you um right off the bat wonderful thank you mr Cantor. um so we received a flurry of questions about cpet and icpet testing um great. so I, I, there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there so i'm just going to quickly just des describe what a cpet is um, it is a cardiopulmonary exercise testing, um, which provides a readout of your multiple systems of functioning, including cardiovascular, pulmonary, which is your heart, musculoskeletal, which is your mus muscle uh, um, function, cellular oxidative systems, how your cells are using energy and oxygen. Readouts also include um, your maximum uh, oxygen usage and your blood pressure and your oxygen saturation in your blood and heart function. Um, all of that information is covered in a, in a CPET test. And then there's the iCPET or invasive CPET testing in which they insert a catheter to measure your blood flow, filling the pressure of your heart, oxygen content, and some more in-depth readings to your blood uh, concentration and, and the, the contents of your blood makeup during your exercise, including things like lactate um, production, which has been shown to be very elevated in ME-CFS patients. Um, and I'll just make a note here um, that Solve ME actually funded the work of Dr. David Sistrom related to IC PET testing and ME-CFS, some of the, the original publications in that area. So um, definitely check out our website if you want to learn more about IC PET testing and ME-CFS. Um, so with that kind of tee up about what a CPET test is and measures and um, why a two-day CPET is important because it measures that over two days of performance rather than just one point in time, um, a couple questions that came out of that. Mm -hmm. um, will your health insurance company or disability insurance company cover the cost of a CPET or ICPET test um, if you need it for uh, your, um, your disability claim? Okay. Great question. There's actually four questions there. So um, first, before I answer the question at all, we what we prefer you do is get the tests out of pocket or we prefer as your lawyers to pay for it. Because if you go through insurance, your health insurance, um, there's a referral record in there and the test usually shows up in your medical records. And if it's not helpful, um, we can't they they get to see it and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, it doesn't always kill a case, but considering how much we've argued that CPET is the gold standard, we don't want an unhelpful CPET um, getting out there. If you know, and sometimes it happens. You know, sometimes CPET doesn't measure exactly what it needs to measure. You know, it's not perfect. Um, it's it's close. It's not it's not perfect though. Um, so the first that we we usually prefer you not try and get it through health insurance to get it approved. And if you we, what we prefer is if you do request two-day CPET or ICPET to be paid for by health insurance, you do it after you have the results of the test. So once you know the test results are supportive, you can send in a request to your health insurance to pay for them. Um, I have e uh, the chances of your health insurance paying for two-day CPET 
is sl- just about zero. I've I've yet to see a health insurance company agree to pay for it um, because usually it's not medically necessary. It's it because the two day seatbelt is designed to measure fatigue, um, and usually doctors don't need it measured to believe that it exists. Um, and that's actually an argument we make in other contexts. Um, so I I do not expect two day CPET to be paid for by health insurance. I CPET I you know I don't have enough experience with it um, because again I haven't sent any of my patients to it yet because it's so new and it's it's expensive and invasive um, compared to two day CPET. Um, but it, I know that it you need a, a primary vision referral to even get it. Um, Because the labs themselves, at least the ones I've talked to, won't do it without a primary physician referral. And that in itself might make it a lot more, a lot easier to get health insurance approval. But I can't, I cannot say for certain whether they would, you know, I'd have to look at your probably health insurance policy and depends who your health insurance company is. And if they deny the claim, you'd have to, you know, go talk to my mother, Lisa Cantor, and she'd help you sue the health insurance company for denying it. And we'd get it down a whole nother road. But um, so that's the answer about the health insurance companies is that we don't recommend trying to get it through them. If you do, you know, file for a claim after, but we I don't think there's a high likelihood um, of either, definitely a, a low likelihood of two-day CPET. Um, there is zero chance of the disability insurance company paying for anything except if they send you to their experts. Um, they'll never send you to see two-day CPET. Um, never. They they just haven't done it yet. They don't, you know, they don't actually want to prove disability because they know two day CPET will prove your disability. Um, but they do not pay for any of these things. But if they want to send you to their own IME doctor or send you to a neuropsych exam, um, they will pay for those. Um, but they will not reimburse you for any testing you get done. And in fact, you can't even if you go to trial and win, you can't even get the costs reimbursed um, uh, by the court because they're all incurred pre-litigation. It's a lousy law. So uh, the answer is to all of them, probably not, unfortunately. It's usually one of those things you have to pay for out of pocket um, to fight, which is extraordinarily unfair. But it's and it's one of the reasons, you know, one of the upsides of hiring a contingency lawyer um, who advance all the costs because they sometimes they will pay for all the testing and you don't have to pay for it out of pocket. Right. Um, two follow-up questions on CPET testing. Um, the first, which is very relevant to the point you were just making, how much does a CPET or ICPET cost? Yeah. Um, is that wait? Is that the only question? Is there a part one of two? The, the second follow-up question is: um, Do I need to go to an ME CFS specialist to get a CPET or ICPET? <laughs> okay. Um, so a two-day CPET. In California, though I believe it's around twenty-two hundred dollars, might be twenty-five hundred dollars at this point. Um, and I see pet. The last time I got a quote, it was fifteen thousand um, dollars. I've heard it being offered for something closer to ten, um, but I've also I, I think a lot where people are doing it for non-disability purposes, so it's going through insurance for non-disability purposes a lot more. Um, so right now, I see pets pretty expensive. I, I don't, you know, I don't know if Dr. Sistrom or any of the other physicians who run labs throughout the country have any kind of assistance programs or anything like that. Um, but again, you know, if you have a, a lawyer on contingency, they it's something they could potentially advance. But um, I, there's enough variance with the I see pet. Um, and how it's done that you'd, you'd have to go talk to your local, whoever's nearest you who does it and see what they charge. Um, and I think there's, you know, kind of a variance in the C- I see that and what they do um, and what kind of results you get or how in depth they go. So I think there's a lot of factors there, um, but it, it's pretty expensive. Um, and as far as do you need an MECFS specialist to get a two day CPET? Absolutely not. Um, you can call the WorkWell Foundation if you want their contact info. You can—I probably should put it on this slide. Um, you can email me, and I'm happy to send it to you. Or I'll, we'll probably post it on the website. Um, you can just call them and schedule it. You, you don't need a um, referral or anything like that. You can tell them that I sent you. You know, I, I Jared and Stacy and I are pretty close at this point. We work a lot together. Um, so you know, they know who I am, obviously. So you can just call them and set it up. I. As to whether or not you need an MECFS specialist to get an ICPET, 
I don't know if you necessarily do. I believe if you have a just primary doctor who is supportive and who will at least talk to the doctor thy CPET lab um, to refer it, you might be able to get it done without an MECFS specialist. Um, but I can't say for certain. And you know, it's kind of a two birds, one stone thing where if you get an MECFS specialist, you have a lot better of an opportunity to um, support your claim because it often takes an MECFS specialist or at least some kind of you know specialist in that in that area to to explain what's going on and to really overpower the uh, insurance company doctors with the the you know their intelligence and brilliance because they're usually you know some of the best in their field and you know one thing I this is actually a great opportunity to mention this is you know with MECFS because I see a lot of my claimants they see their primary care physician physically and they have an MECFS specialist who they see via Skype or over the phone um, like there's one doctor who I, I've worked with several times named uh, Dr. Mary Ackerley uh, who I, I'm very fond of I, and who sees a lot of patients via Skype who have a lot of success working with um, and while a lot of the older lawyers uh, were really skeptical about that um, and they were worried that the insurance company would raise a stink uh, I've pretty it seems to be a pretty successful route. If you have a physical doctor and there's no MECFS specialist near you, see, you know, getting a consult from or seeing someone out of state can often be really effective. And if the insurance company starts to bite down, having a specialist like that to, you know, not only support you as your treater, but they can write like more extensive rebuttals, it, it can be, it can be the difference. Um, so you don't necessarily need an MECFS specialist to get um, two days. You don't you don't need anyone to get a two day CPET. You probably don't need an MECFS specialist to get an ICPET, but it'll be a lot easier. And there's also other benefits from getting an MECFS specialist as well, even if it's someone out of state. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Cantor, for that um, answer. I know that's a complex area. And just to um, to reiterate, um, if you have questions about CPETs or ICPETs or looking for specialists um, either in MECFS or related fields, please don't hesitate to contact our organization. That's one of the things that we can also provide. And also on our website, there's a list of specialists around the country who may be helpful. Um, so, so Mr. Cantor and Asal Vemi in tag team will make sure we get you to the right place. Absolutely. Um, Love it, love it. Um, okay, so now shifting gears slightly into, um, you touched briefly on the um, concerns regarding um, mental health and specifically depression or anxiety that can be caused by the, the experience of going through disability. Um, a question came in of how to document specifically that mental health concerns like depression were caused by the disability rather than the cause of the disability. Awesome. Another great question. I'm loving these questions. Um, so the that's one of the um, main things we I focus on when I'm drafting an appeal. Um, it's a big strategic question. First, you want to you want to decide whether or not you want to. I'm using air quotes over here. Address it at all. You know, in some situations, the medical records are so clear and everything kind of just makes it. There's no, nothing raising any issues. You know, no one actually thinks the depression is that bad or, or the medical records actually say, you know, she's depressed, you know, has been depressed as a result of um, being off work, you know, no medications necessary, you know, it, sometimes the records kind of speak for themselves. And the in, and I look at the file and I say, in order for an insurance company to justify a two year denial, a mental health denial on this, they would have to stretch so insanely far that it, it almost if we were to even bother addressing it, 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 it shines light where we don't even need light shown. Um, so for, we make that strategic question, um, but usually mo you know, the best thing to do is to be mindful and to, and to address it. And how do you do that? So um, first, if you have a mental health professional, getting a letter from that mental health professional is crucial. Um, getting a letter saying from them, yeah, you know, she, we, we have appointments once a week. She became disabled uh, on this date. She came depressed as a result of her, you know, pain, fatigue, and then once she wasn't even able to work, it, it the straw that broke the camel's back, and a letter that explains all that, um, it goes a long way. And a, a letter that also, you know, from a mental health professional saying, I've also reviewed the reports from her medical doctor, and I, absolutely, you know, I 
agree entirely with her. You know, I have no reason to doubt her subjective complaint. She's an honest person. She's credible. Um, and uh, there's certainly no reason to think she's in any way disabled from her mental health conditions. And I'm, excuse me for using she, it's just, you know, a, a default. Um, so the mental health professional letter is ideal uh, to, if you're seeing someone to have them, you know, address these things specifically. Um, if it's before a denial and it's just during the claim, you, you basically just have them a letter saying, you know, um, yes, she's seeing me for, you know, depression and anxiety as, you know, she became depressed as a result of becoming disabled from her physical issues. Like you just have her kind of write a letter which just assumes that you're not disabled for mental health issues. Um, and if, you know, it's post-denial and you've actually got a letter from a mental health professional from the insurance company saying, I think you're disabled for mental health issues and here's why, you have your mental health professional address that. Um, so it, you have a mental health pro professional letter, if, if you can, you know, explaining what you need to explain. Um, the medical records from your primary doctor can also be helpful, and the letters from your primary doctor are helpful, too. You know, often medical records will say, you know, patient has started seeing therapist at my behest due to, uh, you know, pain-related depression or things like that. And if there's things like that in the record, you can just kind of have them reiterate it in a letter saying that you're very clearly disabled from physical issues, just assuming that. Um, you can also, you know, if you write a personal statement, you just say it, you know, you you, you tell them the truth. I, I've been in pain for this long. I've been fatigued for this long. You know, uh, two months after being off work, I, I my doctor told me to start seeing a therapist, which I did. Um, and you just explain what is the result, one's the result of the other, and that, you know, if you were just depressed and there was no pain, first you wouldn't be depressed, and if it was just depression, you could certainly work through that. Like, the only thing that's keeping you from working are the physical issues. You know, even if the depression doesn't help, you know, the physical stuff is what's primarily keeping you um, from working. Um, you can also, you know, you pay attention to if you have s statements written by friends, family, or coworkers, or um, if you can have a supervisor write a letter, that's terrific. You know, they can comment on things like that, that, you know, your attitude was good. You, you were upbeat. You know, the only thing that ever seemed to slow you down was when you, you know, you just got too tired to keep functioning. Um, so you, you, you embed it in the evidence, basically. Um, and basically just have all your medical professionals ad address it either subtly if it's during the claim or directly if there's actual, an actual medical opinion um, justifying that mental health denial. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Cantor. And oh, um, I'd just like sorry, to share. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. And make sure if you if you're concerned about it, make sure you read your policy and you see whether or not the clause says due to mental health conditions or caused or contributed to by. You know, because if it's due to, it's it's a much better position for you to be in, and there's usually a lot less cause for concern um, because. If it's due to, they pretty much have to show that the mental health issues are the primary disabling factor. And if you didn't start getting mental health treatment until after you became disabled or after the physical stuff, it's a really hard burden for them to meet. Um, but if it's caused or contributed to by, depending on what state you're in, it's a much lower burden and there's a lot more cause for concern um, and probably more of a need for you to be proactive about it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to share a comment that came in from one of our viewers that I think is um, very relevant to this conversation. Um, Sue Ellen shares that anxiety can sometimes be um, a misdiagnosis of the dysregulation of blood pressure, which can be proven by either a tilt table test or a doctor's office comparison of prone versus standing blood pressure results. Um, and so this can also be used to prove physical limitations. Um, and thank you, Sue Ellen, for sharing that comment. I think that's very relevant to um, some of the experience folks have with their primary care physician. Um, we're on our last three questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Cantor, again, for staying with us and everyone for watching. Um, this is a related to financial need. Um, I kind of combined a couple questions into one. Um, the question I, that I'll share is where can we, we turn for financial support while disability claims are pending or in appeals? And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, kind of follow up, what if I cannot afford an attorney? Yeah, so another great and unfortunately very tough question. So, well, first I'll start with the easy question with the attorney question. 
if you can't afford an attorney, um, you need to just hire someone on contingency because um, if you if you do need an attorney, you know, because if you hire someone on contingency who advance all the costs, they don't take anything from you unless you win, um, and then you're never paying anything out of pocket. Um, so it's a, that's one of the benefits of a you know that's a firm like us, a contingency firm, is because we never take anything from anyone until we've taken something from the insurance company, um, and for reason we don't want anyone to not be able to afford us now you could if your concern is even then well this attorney wants too big of of, of a fraction of, of what I want uh, you know of, of my benefits I don't know how I'm going to survive on this at, you know that that's a tougher question you know I, I advise talking to different attorneys um, you know I know that we for example are probably on the higher end of the of the contingency rate but because we offer, offer a lot of things that other places don't um, but that also means a lot of places, you know, offer a lower contingency than we do. So just like anything, there there are ranges of what a contingency attorney will charge. Um, but you you should never feel like because you don't have money in the bank, you can't afford representation because that's you know that's why we contingency attorneys um, exist. As far as financial support while you're waiting for a disability claim, that one's tough. So. The first thing is always to, if whatever state you're in, check to see if you have sta a state disability program. California, for example, um, has a great state disability program. It gives you um, up to, depending on your salary level, the absolute maximum is $60,000 uh, over one year. If you make, I think, $100,000 or more, it, it, it's cumulative. Um, other states have nothing. So it really depends on where you are um, and what they offer. You know, some states only offer uh, like a hundred or two hundred bucks a week. So it really does vary. But that's the first place to look. Um, second is, you know, once you've been disabled for five months, you can apply for Social Security disability. But honestly, that's uh, I'm kind of lying to you by even saying that because that process almost always ta almost always takes years. However, uh, and it almost always takes years for people with ME/CFS, unfortunately, um, for reasons that are probably obvious to all you all y'all at this point. Um, but sometimes you file a claim, and three, four months later, boom, Social Security kicks in. You know, it it happens. I, you know, help me if I can figure out why or when, but it happens. So, you know, it's it's also good to get your Social Security disability application in. Um, the only thing to be hesitant about there is to make sure that you have the evidence to support it because a social security disability claim, you have to be unable to earn, I think, $1,200 a month doing anything. It's a much harder standard to meet than most, social, most uh, private disability policies. Um, so apply for social security, but do not depend on it. Check out state disability, but do not depend on it because it may not even exist in your state. Um, those are the only disability related options that you really have there are now everything else i'm about to tell you is from andrew the guy who was you know has been in debt before and tried to get himself out of debt as well this is not legal advice because i'm not a you know a debt counselor i am not anything like that um and i also you know relate to you what some of my other clients have done um but so one thing is zero interest credit cards if you have a good credit score um you and potentially if you have income coming in in your household you can apply for introductory zero interest credit cards or balance transfer cards which give you zero percent for 12 or 18 months that can be the difference maker sometimes for some people depending on your situation now often you know the the more money you need the harder you know sometimes harder it is to get the credit but it's it's some something to try um Often people don't have a great credit and can't pull that off. It's not always a feasible option. But if if you're lucky enough to have a you know another household source of income um, and a good credit score, you can sometimes secure you know twenty five thirty thousand dollars of zero interest credit card loans. Um, there's a company called SoFi that does personal loans at like eight or nine percent, um, which isn't terrible. Um, if you have a four hundred one k. I think there are certain 401ks which allow you to draw um, to take loans out. I don't know if you can do it when you're on disability, though, because it usually requires salary to be coming in. Um, do not ever take out a payday loan. Uh, if, if I had it my way, every single payday loan facility would burn to the ground 
with no one inside it, obviously, but would burn to the ground right now because they are horrific and predatory, and it is almost impossible to get out of that debt cycle outside of declaring bankruptcy. Even if you do end up getting your benefits, uh, you know, you're going to be in such terrible debt from these payday loans that you won't ever get back on your feet. So, you know, I'm sorry to step outside my scope and be super paternalistic. Uh, I really do apologize for that, but please do not, you know, if you can do anything you can to avoid it, do not take out payday loans. I mean, a second mortgage on your house, if you have to just avoid payday loans. Um, you know, uh, friends and family asking for loans, you know, um, if you have student loan debt that you're worried about paying, there is disability related student loan forgiveness out there. Um, and that's really all I can all I can really think of at the moment, unfortunately. There, it, it, it's really tough that there aren't more options. And, it, you know, it's really unfair that they don't get punished. Um, let's say they deny you wrongfully for 18 months, and as a result, you have to sell your house and you take a $60,000 hit that you wouldn't have had to take otherwise, right, on the sale. Um, it's extraordinarily hard for us to get you that 60 grand in court. It's technically possible. It's extremely difficult, and it just shouldn't be. It should be, it should be like filling out a form to get you that money back. But you know, that's just the nature of ERISA. So I'm sorry I don't have more optimistic news for you, but those are the options that I've uh, I've got. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. I think that was um, incredibly comprehensive in terms of the options available, and um, I just second your your sentiment that it is so heartbreaking that um, so many MECFS patients really do run into those limited options financially. And um, again, thank you for, for clarifying. And um, we look forward to helping patients navigate these difficult processes as ever we can. Um, uh, so now this next question, um, and actually the, the next question after you did already answer um, about uh, this question was, ERISA sounds very difficult. Is Social Security easier? Should I do Social Security instead? <laughs> I think you already touched on that. Uh, I touched um, on it, but, but, it's a, but the, that question is important because it's there's not an instead. Um, if you do private disability, and that's a really important question because people get twisted about this all the time. If you get if you are applying for long-term or short-term disability, you have to also apply for anything else you can. So you have to apply for state disability and you have to apply for social security disability. Um, so don't think it's one or the other. I mean, if you want, you can apply for social security and not apply for private disability, that's completely fine. Um, but if you apply for private disability through your employer and file a claim, you have to also seek social security and state disability and if eligible workers comp benefits as well um and so keep that in mind um the other aspect is it easier now huh, i'm not a social security lawyer so i haven't been through that whole process i think the answer is probably no um in that first i know the, the legal standard is harder to meet so for private disability, there's pretty much always a wage requirement in there, and, and that's how they measure disability. So you have to, um, you know, if you have a certain wage loss or income loss, um, that's um, certain wage loss or, or income loss. That's how they measure whether or not you're disabled. So basically. If you know, if you have a two hundred thousand dollar a year job and you're disabled to the point where you can only make one hundred fifty grand a year, that probably qualifies you for for private disability benefits, given the terms of the policy, at least residual benefits. Um, no matter what you make or how skilled you are, um, in order to qualify for Social Security disability, you have to be unable to earn twelve hundred dollars a month. So the more the more training and skill that you have, and usually the higher income that you have, the harder it is to get Social Security disability. So the standard itself is really difficult. I mean, the upside is you don't have. I mean, you assume the Social Security Administration isn't against you the way the ERISA insurers are. Um, but from what I've heard, that's you know, it sounds like they can be just as bad. I mean, and it, it takes a lot longer. Um, the standards harder, so I can't I can't say it's going to be any easier. And unfortunately, you you probably have to do both. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. Um, so I know we've gone online, but I think these were so many questions. I'm really glad and grateful 
let Mr. Cantor, you could take the time to answer all of these questions. I'm going to wrap it up with this last question, and um, I'm not going to share the information because this is a little personal of the questioner. Um, this person is currently going through, uh, it sounds like currently going through a disability process with an insurance company um, who is asking them to sign forms regarding access to very intimate personal information that the person does not feel applies in their case, specifically STD results, rape consulting, and domestic violence counseling. They say that this does not seem okay. Um, do they need to sign over access to this information or should they fight it? Specifically, do they feel they should fight it to set a precedent for others who may have this sort of invasive process thrust upon them? Yeah, oh, it's a tough question. Um, do you, well, I guess the first thing I'd ask is, are you sure it's the, is the insurance company, is this an insurance company form from the disability insurer or is the medical or is the medical provider re requiring a release which requires her to sign off on those things to get the records? Do you happen to know? Um, let's see. Uh, it does not say specifically. It does name the insurance company, but I don't want to share that specifically. Um, asking for permission to, it sounds like it is a, a disability claim. It is the insurance company. The insurance company specifically is asking for access to these personal information. Um, Yeah, I think the problem is uh, I have like four questions that come up that I want to ask. Um, is assuming that it's just part of a boilerplate form, and this is not a like they it's not a request where they specifically ask for these really personal things and direct it to her. Um, if that's the case, you have to call me. We have to talk about that. But assuming it's just part of a bigger boilerplate request. Um, it's tough because, you know, my default response is that if you don't have anything harmful to your case that you are worried about, you know, and it doesn't sound like there's anything harmful to the case. It's just like personal stuff that you wouldn't want insurance company people to see, which is certainly reasonable. Don't don't get me wrong. Um, my default response as the disability lawyer is. I'm sorry, but you know, it's, I know it's tough. I know it's really uncomfortable to have them have this information, but my job is to protect your disability claim and it serves you no benefit to say no. The, you know, you could, if you think it through, what happens if you say, if you push back, they um, say, okay, fine, no problem, but there's still a chance that they've red flagged your claim somehow, or they are going to pay, you know, or they're going to kind of look for this information, try and get it otherwise, or ask someone else about it. Because just because you don't authorize them to get the information doesn't mean they can't ask a, a doctor they are authorized to talk to, um, or something like that. Um, so, and when it's, you know, these big boilerplate requests, um, there's a, you know, um, the other option is they say no, is they respond and say, no, we need this information. And now there's a red flag raised and you still have to give them the information. So I just, I get concerned about what they do in response to, to you pushing back because I always worry that their response is going to be, oh, okay, we should be looking really carefully at this stuff, or at the very least, we know she doesn't want us seeing this. This is a tender point that they can push, or this is something that they can press to ask for if they want to make your life difficult. Um, but I, I will say, I, I don't want, I, I would want to see that form because I can't remember seeing a request for any STD related info. Usually what they ask, they suggest is like really personal financial info. Um, so I, I, I'd be, very curious to see the 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 request itself um, to give you to give you more feedback because I, I certainly wouldn't want to give you any any guidance without actually seeing the document. Um, but that's that's my default response without seeing it is that I usually just tell people to grit and bear it because that's usually the best way to protect their disability claim. But you know, there's obviously usually a lot more details involved before I can I can say anything like that concretely, but I'd be happy to talk to you at any point. It sounds like certainly something worth talking about.
Absolutely. Well, we'll make sure to connect you with that particular uh, web webinar attendee offline so that you can explore that in more depth. But thank you so much for that information, Ms. Can Mr. Cantor. And that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, everyone who stuck it through, I know this is longer than our usual webinars, but we were so grateful that Mr. Cantor agreed to stay longer because we knew there'd be lots of questions. And, um, and I just, as always, our community is so smart and capable and asks such really poignant and, and relevant questions, and um, especially with some of the advice that was provided from folks who have been it through this. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you so much to our community for making um, these webinars at Solve ME possible. As always, we are driven by your donations to make this information available to the community at large. Um, we hope you'll follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available shortly on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to subscribe to our organization for more information on great webinars like these. And um, Mr. Cantor, again, thank you so much. I learned a lot. This was fascinating and really helpful information, and I hope our community feels the same. Um, any final thoughts before we sign off, Mr. Cantor? You know, well, first, I hope uh, we figure out a time for me to come back very soon because this was really a lot of fun. I love I love doing things like this. You know, it's it's um, it's nice to be able to have a, an occupation which gets me to just be able to talk to people about what I do and, and be helpful along the way. And, you know, I really I really do love this. I love the opportunity to help all these people. And, you know, it's the biggest thing I want to say is the big point is I know I've dropped a lot of um, pessimistic information and it has not been a rosy presentation. Um, but the, the things to take away are that it, it is getting better. I mean, there are so many people out there, lawyers and, you know, people in the MECFS community, WorkWell Foundation and Ithaca, like David Sistrom, who are, who are doing incredible work, um, and we are making a lot of progress. I mean, the progress we've made in the last three years, on the legal end at least, has been huge. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. And, I, and despite how stacked the deck is against all of you and all of the negative information I've shared, the big upside is that the system is designed to kind of take advantage of those who don't know what they're doing. While it does end up giving people like you who do know what they're doing and who do have the right guidance along the way, a lot of opportunities to really put themselves um, in a great position to protect their benefits, um, you know, and in turn their, you know, your financial well-being. And I, I can't emphasize enough. Um, thank you again for for taking you know time out of your day to to talk to me. And please email me or call me. Um, with any case specific questions, always happy to continue the conversation and we'll all be in touch soon. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Cantor, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we'll be signing off from all of us at the Solve ME CFS Initiative. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your attention. And we'll be in touch soon with additional webinars throughout there. Great. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye, thank you.